Well, howdy, friends. Brian Fleshing and Matt River Outfitters in the Midwest Fly Fishing Schools, and welcome back to another episode in our series on fly casting. Today, we're gonna to take a look at some things that quite frankly, we've talked about in the past, uh, but I know we've got a lot of episodes out there and it's kind of tough to dig through them all. Uh, and it's amazing to me, I still run into a lot of folks that have questions about some of these things I'm gonna talk about right now in this episode. So just wanted to throw them all together uh, in one place here. So first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about the fly line. And it's amazing to me that I run into so many people that do not know why a fly line is two colors, sometimes three colors. A lot of folks think it's just for aesthetics, and sure, it looks cool. A lot of folks think that it's uh, to gauge distance, which it certainly can help me to gauge distance, but there is a scientific reason, and there's just a bunch of jacks crashing bait over there, but there is a scientific reason why this fly line is multicolored. Now, you, uh, many of you know that I fish, when I'm fishing warm water, either in the salt or in sweet water, I fish a fly line designed by our great friend Flip Pallet and made by Cortland called the High Viz Flip Sight Line. Perfect for sight casting. And the High Viz Flip Sight Line is first of all bright orange up front, and then it's white on the back end. And the bright orange indicates the head of the line or the weight forward portion of the line. Now that's the fat part. And the, the white part of the line is the skinny part, the running line. So there is a reason for that color change. And it's very, very important to understand that I must have, in order to pick up, it meaning in order to pick up this fly line off the water, I must have the orange inside the tip of my fly rod, okay? So I must have the orange inside. Now I can shoot and shoot into the white, of course, and I'm gonna do that very, very often, especially when I'm fishing saltwater. So the orange is inside my rod tip. I pick up, I'm gonna shoot into the white and always cup your fly line when you shoot so that that doesn't happen. My bad. The fat part of your fly line can pull the skinny white part, but there's no way that the skinny white part can pick up that fat head. If you try to pick up that fat head on the white running line, it's gonna flop around like a wet noodle and just collapse on you just like that. <clears throat> no way can you pick up this fly line on the white part of the running line. So <clears throat> your fly line, uh, and it's not just Cortland, I mean, Scientific Anglers, Rio, Airflow, they all make excellent fly lines, and all of them do this mostly on their premium lines. Now, if you don't have a multicolored line, some of the lesser priced lines these days are not multicolored, you can always take a Sharpie, which I always have a Sharpie somewhere close, I keep it in my kit bag. You can take a Sharpie, and create a black mark where the head of your fly line ends and the running line starts. And there's two ways you can determine where that is. Literally by running your fingers along it and you can feel where that head ends and the running line, the skinny line starts. <clears throat> and you can also look at the taper diagram. It'll tell you how long the head of that line is so you can measure it and get a good idea of where that transition is as well. And just take a black mark. I usually make them about yay long. And that way that black mark has to be inside your rod tip in order to make a cast. Another thing I wanted to talk uh, real briefly about is kind of this uh, something that I've been working on today and I tend to work on most every day when I fish. And that is with average size flies, average, say medium, average, or even smaller size flies. The method of fly casting that we have shown you and that Flip Palette and I have shown you 
in, um, in multiple, multiple videos, is, is best often done, especially if you're in a boat, using as little motion as possible. There's none of this heave ho and back and forth and moving your feet. One of the worst things you can do on the, fr on the bow of a skiff is to move your feet. So we don't wanna move our feet and we don't wanna move our body at all. The more stoic we can be, the more efficient this cast will be and the more effective the bend of the fly rod will be. So I always try to teach people about this comfortable little work zone right here in front of you. This comfortable little work zone is where you execute the fly cast. It is where you're gonna tie knots right here in front of you. It's where if you tie flies, your vise is gonna be set up in this comfortable work zone. Heck, if you do needlepoint or crochet, or notice when you eat dinner tonight, where your dinner plate is. It's in that comfortable little work zone about the size of a dinner plate right in front of you. And if you can think about fly casting, and I mean the entire th thing, the whole stroke, the haul, and everything, if I can keep that confined to this comfortable little work zone, you're gonna be blown away at how much more efficient your cast is, about how much more accurate your fly cast is. Your loops are gonna be tighter, the rod's gonna do more work for you, and you're not flailing around and giving yourself more of a chance for the fish to detect your motion. You're not rocking the boat, your, your feet aren't slamming on the deck, and also your feet are less likely to uh, catch on the fly line, or you're less likely to step on the fly line if you leave your feet planted. When you practice fly cast, think about just working, and like I said, even that haul, just work in this comfortable little work zone, and you'll be amazed at how far, how efficient, and how accurate your fly cast will be if you concentrate on working in that comfortable little work zone. Now, there's certainly exceptions to this rule. We've shown you some of those. When you start fishing really big flies, when you start fishing with sinking fly lines, for example, we've done, for example, a couple of videos with Blaine chocolate. Of course, you know the Blaine fishes flies that are like that, and you may have to move the rod a little bit more in order to throw one of those giant flies. But if you're working with average size bass flies, smallmouth flies, panfish flies, and even average redfish flies and such, this comfortable little work zone tip, I think will greatly, greatly help you in your casting. Um, just a couple, three things that I often have to remind myself, even though I've been teaching fly casting for now, as of 20, 24, 36 years of my life and fishing a, a, a lot uh, for more than that, I find that I have to remind myself to do these things so I don't feel bad giving you all a reminder. And the first thing is, is that you must start and you must end every cast with your rod tip below your belt. You start with your rod tip at the water level when you go to pick up. And then you wind up with your rod tip at the water level when you, when you go to start your retrieve. So put your rod tip in the water, then start your retrieve, form your loop and make your presentation and then rod tip back in the water. Many, many years ago, it was probably 1996, and I was working with uh, the late, great Lefty Cray. Uh, I was a young whippersnapper and I said, I said to Lefty, I said, Lefty, what's the number one mistake that beginning fly casters will make? And Lefty said, Brian, everybody wants to start their cast with the rod here. And he was right. It's your inclination to start with the cast here and then there's nowhere to go. Of course, you're gonna go back with your rod. You're not gonna form a tight loop. And as Flip Pallet often says, you're only making half of a fly cast at that point. A fly cast should act like an airplane taken off a runway. And by putting your rod tip in the water to start, you are making that runway as long as possible for your pilot to take off, okay? So I start with the rod tip in the water, and then I pick up. There's also a video that we did with Flip along those lines about lifting most of the line off the water before you go to form your loop. Check that one out too. It kind of ties into what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> but remember to start with your rod tip low, form your loop, form your loop, rod tip back down, 
and now you're ready to start your retrieve. Along those same lines, I talked about this a little bit earlier today, but remember when you're retrieving a fly, to have your rod tip at the water level or even in the water. Kelly Gallup talks a lot about this streamer fishing. You must have your rod tip in the water. I see so many people retrieving and they'll have their, their rod tip like this, okay? And that, look at what the line's doing. I'm, I'm creating slack and we all know that slack is bad in any kind of contact fly fishing like this. And not to mention, when my rod tip is up like that and the line is bouncing, not only am I losing control, but I'm, my, that line is slapping the water and I'm alerting the fish to the fact that I'm there and doing what I'm doing. And we almost never wanna do that, okay? So start with your rod tip in the water, end with it in the rod tip in the water, and keep it there as you retrieve that fly. Don't bring it up here and do this bouncing trick with the fly line. I, I, it's amazing how many people I see doing that. And last but not least today, just a reminder, move your thumb to the end of the cord grip. I'm telling you friends, I have seen so many people uh, improve, greatly improve their casting just by moving their thumb to the end of the cord grip. Watch videos and watch how many people are casting with their thumb back here. Remember what they taught you in Little League Baseball? They taught you to choke up on the bat because you got higher bat speed. Well, choking up on the fly rod is gonna give you higher tip speed. It's gonna give you much greater control over where the tip goes. And we all know that the tip is what forms the, the loop and your loop is of utmost importance. So move that thumb to the end of the cork grip. That's why I love these super flared out cork grips. Um, you know, Echo's doing them, Sage is doing some, I think Loomis has some. One of my favorite fly rods right here, you all know the Echo Prime, and it's got this fantastic flared out uh, cork grip out up front, and my thumb just fits, and it's just push button. Like just opening a screen door, boom, and it goes right to the target. So move that thumb to the end of the cork grip, and you're gonna see your accuracy and your efficiency just go through the roof, I promise you. So as always, friends, thanks for watching. Just a review of some tips that we've given in previous videos. Uh, <clears throat> go back and watch all of the videos in our fly casting series. We've got some exciting things to come. Uh, we've got some new special guests coming up in the series. So as always, we appreciate you being here. If you ever have any questions, remember, give us a call at the shop or send us an email. We're always here to help. Customer service is what we do for a living. Fly fishing is what we love and what we sell. So stay tuned, as always. We've got a lot of fly fishing content coming your way.